You ready to hear a word of God? Amen. So, you know, I like to plan ahead when I preach and because uh, it, it helps me to focus on, on other aspects of what I do as a pastor. You might not know this, but preaching is not the only thing that I do. We lead teams, we visit people, we care, we create strategies. And I had a sermon that was done months in advance for today. And those are always great because then I get to spend the whole week coming back from vacation just focusing on the staff and reconnecting. And then some crazy stuff started to happen in the world um, right before I left on vacation. And uh, just two weeks before my family, uh, Pastor Liz and I went on vacation. To be clear, not our family, just Pastor Liz and I, because when you take the kids, it's not a vacation. Um, but it was, we went on vacation. And uh, two weeks before that, the Middle East pretty much just blew up and uh, went to war. And then right before I left, the day before my plane left, I got a phone call from a representative of kind of just the government, just kind of letting churches know everywhere. And not just this church, so don't freak out about this church, just churches everywhere, that because of the religious context of the war that's taking place in the Middle East, that there have been some threats on spiritual houses um, across America, not here, but across America. And just to be on alert, we let our safety team know, and we hired more security, all those things, just to be safe. Um, and then while I was on vacation on the day of my anniversary, October 25th, 18 people were shot dead in the state of Maine. Um, seem, seemingly, you know, for no reason, not that there ever is a reason, a good reason. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, I came home and I had this message to preach on Sunday and I couldn't because I started to feel something that I'm even ashamed to say as a pastor, but I started to feel a little bit of, uh, fear and I didn't like that feeling. I knew that I was feeling it because I was changing the way I was walking through airport security. I knew I was feeling it because it, it was changing the way I was looking at people. And I knew I was feeling it, and I knew if I didn't address it, it would subtly and slowly change the way I live my life because fear does that. And so I did what any good preacher would do. I started preaching to myself. <laughs> And I, and, I, and I opened up my Bible, and I went to those Bible verses, and I just started preaching to my soul. And at the end, I felt so much better. And I thought, this is good. And God said, good. Now I preach that same message to the people. And so well, the message that I was going to preach, scratch that, and I want to preach to you a brand new message that I wrote just a couple days ago that I think might minister to you, because I don't think I'm the only one that's afraid. So I want to speak to you on the topic of living with fear. Living with fear. This message is for you. Say amen. amen. With all the circumstances in the world today, pundits predicting World War III, financial markets in correction, people worried about their retirement and their savings. Election year is coming up next year, 2024, big year. And uh, got to be honest, I'm not optimistic, not, <laughs> not excited about what it's going to do to our country. And uh, my son even, he's 11 years old, and he's homeschooled. They're thinking about putting it in public, and he's like, I don't want to go. And we're like, is it because you want more days off? And at 11, he's like, nah, school shootings. At 11. And so, and maybe you don't watch the news. Maybe those macro factors don't really bother you. It doesn't even need to be the macro fears. It can be the micro fears, you know, the ones that we all kind of deal with on our everyday life, the common stuff. Like, uh, I looked up a bunch of common fears that people have. Fear of social interactions, Right? Yeah, y'all the people, if you have that fear, who when I say, turn to your neighbor, <laughs> you're like, God, no. Please, no. I didn't come to church for that. Please. But like, high five three people, you're like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want that. And um, there's fear of disease, right? You get, you get a cold, and some of us are addicted to porn sites. Others are addicted to WebMD, and we just can't get off it, you know? And we just put in our symptoms, and WebMD is not good for you. I'm just going to tell you right now, if you're really curious, go to the actual doctor. Yeah, you type in headache, it's a journey. A headache, it's like dehydration, exhaustion, cancer. What, that went from, like a real serious, real quick. <clears throat> Fear of enclosed spaces, anybody claustrophobic like me? They tried to give me an MRI the other day. Have you ever seen one of those things? It's a, it's a coffin. They gave me a button. They said, hit it if you start to freak out. I hit it. They said, sir, we haven't even put you in yet. I'm just making sure it works, ma'am. <laughs> just, just making sure this, this button is operational. Because <laughs> I'm going to freak out when you get me into this thing, I promise you. <clears throat> Anybody afraid of heights? Afraid of heights? I didn't think I was afraid of heights <clears throat> until our vacation. <clears throat> uh, we had tickets to go to the top of the Eiffel Tower. 
and we accidentally walked it. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. How do you accidentally walk the Eiffel Tower? We could not find the elevator. We had tickets to get on the elevator, go to the top. We couldn't find the elevator, so we started walking up these stairs, thinking that these stairs would take us to the elevator that takes you to the top. And then when we got halfway, we realized this is not the way to the elevator. This is the top of the Eiffel Tower. But at that point, we were already more than halfway up, so we can't go down. So we went up. We got off at the first floor, and we were like, hey, can we take the elevator? And they're like, there's no elevator on the first floor. You have to keep walking to the second floor to then take the elevator. So we're walking up the Eiffel Tower, and the, the good advice is don't look down. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen the Eiffel Tower. There's no walls. It doesn't matter where you look. You're high. <laughs> so... I just closed my eyes, held on to the thing, and just walked away to the top. Liz was behind me and pretended like I was brave and led the way. Amen. <laughs> and uh, fear heights. And then there's things like fear of failure, fear of death. I think the first thing I want to preach to you if you're taking notes is that if you really want to overcome fear, you have to learn to live with it. Because I really don't believe that the goal is to get rid of fear. I think you have to learn how to live with fear because fear, and I'm going to flip this on you right now, to an extent, is actually good for you. Like, you need fear. Like, we laugh about fear of social interaction, but we need some of that. My, my son was trying to trade Pokemon cards with this kid at his jiu-jitsu, and, and he got fleeced. He traded, like, three really good cards for one card that was gold, but it was completely fake. But the kid told him it was awesome, so he came back to me. He's like, Dad, look at this card I got. And I used to trade cards when I was a kid, so I was like, that's fake. And he was like, but the kid said it was real. And he said he was my friend. I'm like, no, everybody who says is your friend <laughs> is your friend. And I'm, I'm like, I got to balance, right? Because I'm like, I don't want to raise him to not trust people, but I want to raise him to have a healthy distrust of some people. Like, you got to have some, like, you got to have some sus in you. Yeah. <laughs> or you could get tooken. You know what I'm saying? You got to have some, like, stranger danger. Got to have a little bit of that in you. Fear of getting into an accident, car accident. I hope you have. I hope if you didn't have that, you wouldn't put your seatbelt on. Right? It's the fear of tickets that keep us from speeding. The fear of getting sick. I lost a family member to COVID. It's a serious thing. But I'll tell you something that changed in my life ever since COVID. I wash my hands wherever I go. Multiple times a day. Right? Fear of public speaking. I had a young preacher come up to me, ask me, how long until you get up there and you're no longer nervous when you preach? I said, well, I've been doing it 25 years, I can tell you, when I get there. Because I'm still nervous. I still get nervous when I see you, but I'm grateful for that nervousness. You know what that nervousness does? It makes me pray more. It makes me prepare harder. If I wasn't afraid, I'd come up here unprepared and it wouldn't work. It wouldn't flow. God wouldn't flow because God partners with you. He doesn't just do things for you. And so you got to do your part so that God can do his part. Everything that's going on in the Middle East is very sad. It's very tragic. But I'll tell you what, as afraid as I am, I have never prayed more for two countries than I have ever in my life. That I'm praying for the people of Israel and the people of Palestine. I'm, 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 I'm praying some good is coming out of fear. Fear is good to have. If you're taking notes, write this down. It just can't have you. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. <clears throat> a spirit of fear. That's the difference. A spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and of self-discipline. Today's message is called living with fear. Listen, not living in fear. Because there's a difference between living with fear and living in fear. I've defined it for you. This is the definition of living in fear. Living in fear is to be controlled and paralyzed with worry, stress, and anxiety about the things that you cannot control. You know, let me, this is how you know. I'm going to start calling you out. This is how you know, but lovingly. This is how you know if you're living in fear. You're living in fear if you choose to live life alone. Rejecting the possibility of friendship because within friendship lies the possibility of rejection. So I'm just not going to have friends. I'm protecting myself. You're not protecting yourself. You're paralyzing yourself. You know you're living in fear if you're a helicopter parent. Send your kid to school with a helmet and sunblock. Every, every day. And... And be careful because oftentimes caring is, is, is a disguise for controlling. And, and we just have to be careful, parents, listen, that what we pass down is faith and not fear. 
that what we leave our kids is not an inheritance of anxiety. Because if we're freaking out, you think they're not going to pick up on that? You think they're not going to take that and then bring that into their children? Sometimes we've got to be the one who has faith in the house and have that boldness and have that courage. You're living in fear. Listen, when you pack your calendar with commitments, because God forbid you disappoint somebody. You're not being a friend, you're being afraid. You know, you're living in fear when you're so tight with your money, you won't be generous, you won't tithe, you won't give, because an unexpected expense might come. That's not being led by wisdom, that's being led by worry. Fear keeps you from stepping out in faith into your calling. God's calling you to get involved in church. God's calling you to step into ministry. God's calling you to lead a group. And you go, no, no, because at my last church, and so what you're doing is, and you, you are, and you're not, and so I'm just learning from my experience. You're not learning from your experience. You're projecting your experience. You're projecting your past experience into future expectation. And if that's all you project into the future, then that's all you'll experience in the future. And you will be caught in a cycle of fear and disappointment, never breaking free. I want to teach you today how to leverage fear, how to live, not just be free from it, but better taught to live with it and use it and have it actually add value to your life. I've got five things for you. I'm going to try to hit them as quick as I can. The first three come from Paul in that very passage in Timothy. He said, power, love, and self-discipline. Let's get into those first three. Power. Here's what we're going to do. The first thing we're going to do if we're going to live with fear is we have to frame fear. We have to frame fear. We have to put fear in the proper context. Up on the screen, you're going to see a picture of two rides. Do you see it on my side here? We got two rides. Go ahead, put it on the screen. <clears throat> Whenever you want, you can put it on the screen. You guys see these two rides? All right, the ride on the top is a ride that you will find at your, you know, your strawberry festival that you will find at, you know, and it spins and it twists and it turns. The ride on the bottom is the Hulk coaster at Universal Studios. Both of these rides are extreme. Both of these rides are fast. One of these rides, I got no problem getting on. The other one, I will not get on. I'll get you one guess. Yeah, I don't mind the Hulk. The Hulk goes faster than the one on the, on the, on the top. The Hulk has loop-de-loops. But the thing is, the Hulk was built by engineers, <laughs> scientists, and it was tested, and it was proven, and most importantly, it wasn't on I-4 an hour before it started turning on. I don't mess with that top ride. I don't know who made that. That's some dude in his garage like this. Let's, hey, you know what we should do? We should make it spin. <laughs> then we'll sell it to the fair, and it'll be on them if anything happens. I don't trust it. It's scary. It's, it's, it's crazy. It goes, I don't trust it because of who made it. But the one on the bottom, listen, it's faster. It's scary. I might throw up, but at least I know how it'll end. Because I trust the maker. I'm afraid of the ride, but my fear is placed within the context of the one who created the thing that I'm riding on. Am I preaching to anybody today? <laughs> Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth. By your great power and by your outstretched arm, nothing is too hard for you. Here it is. Here it is. Here's the application. You have to put your fear in the context of God's power. Put your fear in the context of God's power. Context matters. Somebody comes at my pregnant wife with a knife. I'm afraid and I'm fighting. But if that person is her OBGYN, I'm afraid, but I'm trusting because of what's going to come out of it. Context matters. When you know who's holding the scalpel, when you know who's holding the knife, it matters. And you've got to put your fear within the context of the one who's putting you through what you're going through. The fear of public speaking, I have it right now. But I put the, my fear within the context of God's power. And the fact that in the Bible, he preached through donkeys, he preached through rocks, he could preach through trees, he could pre he preached through people who are a lot worse than me. And so if he could use them, he could use me. Yeah. 
I'm just putting it in context. I ain't great, but he is. Afraid of being able to pay the bills and, and all that. I, I get that fear. But you need to put your fear of being able to pay within the context of God's power to provide. Yeah, and then something happens when you know who on the other side of that. And your fear turns almost to excitement. I look at those roller coasters, I get excited. I know, it's, I know I'm not going to have a lot of fun. I'm going to get a headache. I might throw up, but it's going to be exciting. When you know who owns it, who controls it, you can look at your trials with a level of excitement. So, man, I don't know how I'm going to pay these bills, but I can't wait to see that tax return. That tax return is going to be fat. God's going to do something. I just know it. The promotion's coming. The raise is coming. When you get sick and you go to the doctor and you get the diagnosis and it's not good, just, I get excited. I can't wait to preach this story on Sunday. I can't wait to tell this testimony because I'm putting my disease within the context of God's power to heal. I know what's going to come out of it. And, and what if I don't get healed? And what if I die? Then forgive me if I'm a little too much, then I'm excited to see what's going to come out of my death. Because I've seen that too. Maybe God will use my death like he used the death of a man named Stephen in the New Testament to start a revival. Like he used the death of my sister-in-law through COVID to reunite the family. Like he used my, the death of my son to start this church. Like he used the death of Jesus to kill death itself. I'm excited to see how he's going to turn it around because when I get sick, hear me. And if there's anybody who's sick, terminally ill, listening to this message today, you're not just going to draw your confidence from God's power to heal. You're going to draw your confidence from God's power to raise the dead. So that no matter what happens, you know that this ends with him getting glory. And for my good, I trust in him. I built my life on him. Lamentations 3, 21 through 22. Yet I still dare to hope. Where is at the end of their rope today? Dare to hope. When I remember this, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Here's my next one. And they all start with F, by the way, to help you remember this when you get home. It was frame fear. Here's the second one. Feel God's love. Feel God's love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out all fear. I got two more stories about Paris. I'm going to give you this one now. They all take place in Disneyland, Paris Disneyland, which is Liz's bucket list to go to see all of them one day. I thought that might have changed. Paris Disneyland was pretty cool. We were trying to get on this one ride. It was her least favorite ride. It was, it, they don't have it here in Orlando. It's, it's kind of like a pirate ship one. You ever seen those pirate ships that go up and down and do that thing? So this was like that, but it was like Slinky Dog. And it was like, and it didn't just go with momentum. It went like, and it's, it's her least favorite ride. And we're not, we don't live in Paris, so we got to get on this ride or else we're never going to get on this ride because I'm probably not coming back. And so the wait was like 45 minutes, and we paid for this extra pass, but it didn't work on this ride. And so I'm standing with her at the front, and it says 45 minutes for this wait, which we can't do because there's other things we got to try. And then the single rider line has zero minutes. Y'all know about that single rider line? You just get on the So I look at Liz. I go, hey, let's just go one after the other. It's a single ride. We'll, we'll go. We'll talk about it when we get off. We'll have a good time. We'll be on and we'll be off. Single rider. You go first. I'll go second. <laughs> she said, <laughs> she looked at me. She said, heck no. I'm either going on that ride with you next to me while I'm going on it or we are not getting on this ride at all. And I'm over there trying to argue with her, trying to share facts. This ride has been tested by engineers. It's been proven by science. You think if this ride could hurt people that they would have this ride open? Just get on the ride. It's going to be good. She's like, no, I need you to go with me in order for me to be calm enough to get on this ride. Sometimes facts don't calm fear. Sometimes, sometimes in order to overcome a feeling, you need a feeling. Sometimes to overcome fear, you need presence. You need, and the facts don't help. We, kept, we keep trying to speak facts to our fear and, not, and we don't feel any better because they don't help. I don't like alligators. Went to Gatorland one time years ago and they had this thing in the middle where you like sit on the alligator and like you wrestle the alligator and it was like, and the guy was like, who wants to go? It's like, not me. He's like, oh, you should come. He goes, alligators only bite people one in three million. As if that fact <laughs> was supposed to make me feel any better 
about sitting on top of the alligator. I'm like, no, thank you, sir. And I bet the one in three million was the one that sat on his head. <laughs> I'm good. Facts don't always help. Yet we try the same approach in the church. Hey, God's in control. Don't you know God's in control? He's got this. I just want to tell some of my Christian friends sometimes like, bro, that's not helping. I know that. I got the same Bible you got. I read that. I believe it. I'm still freaking out. Your verses are not making me feel better right now. Your comment on the post, it's not helping. What I need isn't facts. What I need is a feeling of peace that surpasses facts. Psalm 61, 2 through 4, I call, this is where God comes in because he can do both. I call as my heart grows faint, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. Someone say strong tower. Taking refuge in the shelter of your wings. Someone say your wings. The metaphors here are beautiful because the author uh, applies two metaphors. He applies a strong castle and he applies a mother bird. Why? Because the strong castle is strong. It's factually, it's hard, it's impenetrable, that's great. But a strong castle can't do something that a mother bird can do. Comfort, hug, love. And God says, I do both. Ooh, isn't that good? When I was a kid, I fell off my bike, ripped off my, my chin, my, my skin of my chin. And I went to my dad, who's over there running safety for me, security. And, uh, and I went to my dad, and my dad's very chill. Nothing gets him nervous. He's just like, so I come him, chin hanging from my face. <clears throat> and he's like, oh, you'll be good. <laughs> he's like, takes the Band-Aid, cleans me up. You're fine. You're going to be great. And hey, no worry. Hey, we'll take you to the doctor tomorrow or later on. We'll get you some stitches. You'll be fine. It'll be okay. Don't worry about it. I fell off a building one time. I walked it off. <laughs> Anybody have dads like that? Anybody have a dad like that? You know? And I'm like, he's very factual. You're not going to die. Oh, okay. Didn't even know that was in the equation. <laughs> and, uh, it's possible. All right, cool. So he, he's, like, he's all dad. And, but he, when he's done with me, I'm still crying. Because you helped me physically. <laughs> but my heart. I fell off my bike. My chin's hanging from my face. Right? So then, thank God I got a mom. My mom comes over after my dad does this whole first aid thing. And she goes, shh. It's okay, baby. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> but I needed both. I needed both. Here's how I wrote it. God is strong enough to keep the enemy out. And soft enough to quiet the anxiety. He is strong enough to keep out the enemy and soft enough to quiet the anxiety. He is strong enough and his word is strong enough to keep the devil at bay, but he's also shh enough to quiet your soul. He can do both. So here's how we're going to apply this. Listen, when we get afraid, we're going to know where to run. <clears throat> know where to run. Remember I said leverage fear? When people are afraid, they run. That's okay. Just run to the right thing. Just run to the right person. Just run into God's presence. Because when you run into God's presence, he will protect you and he will comfort you. When I get afraid, listen, I'm talking to you right now. I'm not running to the bottle of alcohol and I'm not running to the bottle of painkillers. Why? Because I'm not trying to not feel all that does is numb you. But if you numb your fear, you also numb your peace. So I'm not trying to not feel. I'm trying to feel the peace and presence of God. When I get afraid of my financial standing, I'm not running to my 401K. I'm running to my Z88.3. And I'm going to put on that Christian, that's Christian radio station for anybody outside of Orlando. And I don't care if the music's good or not. I just need somebody to sing about Jesus, to uplift the name of Jesus, to remind me who he is and his love and his presence. That's where I'm running to worship, not to my bank account, to worship 
Be a kid. Run to the covers. Remember when you were a kid and you run to the blanket? Like that blanket's going to do anything. Run to the covers. Just don't run to the covers of your bed. Run to the covers of the Almighty and close. Focus on what you can control. So we got frame fear, feel God's love, focus on what you can control. First Samuel chapter 13, 6 to 7, the Israelites are facing an army that is bigger than them. When the Israelites saw that they were troubled, that when the Israelites saw that they were outnumbered and in deep trouble, they ran for cover, hiding in caves and pits, ravines and brambles and cisterns, wherever. They retreated across the Jordan River, refugees fleeing to the country of Gad and Gilead, but Saul held his ground in Gilgal, and his soldiers still with him, look at this part, but scared to death. Now that's how Saul and his army, that's what they do when they get afraid. They stand still. Now look at Saul's son, Jonathan, same day, look how he responds, chapter 14, verse 1. Later that day, Jonathan... Saul's son said to his armor bearer, while everybody's crowded up in the cave, here's what Jonathan says, come on, let's go. Fear paralyzes you. Faith mobilizes you. Fear keeps you from moving. Faith gets you moving. Let's go. I love verse 6. Look at verse 6. Maybe God will work for us. There's no rule that says God can only deliver us by using a big army. No one can stop God from saving when he sets his mind to it. I love maybe God. Because what he says is what we all know. I'm not really sure how this is going to turn out. But there's only one way to find out how it's going to turn out. And that's for me to get out. I'm not going to find out how this turns out if I'm staying in the cave. So I'm going to focus on what I can control. I'm going to get out and maybe God. And if it happens, boom, God did it. If it doesn't happen, then God did it. But maybe God. Now look at verse 8 through 10. Jonathan said, here's what we'll do. <laughs> we'll cross over the pass and let the enemy see that we're there. That's a bad plan. <laughs> Let me think about that for a second. I read the Bible sometime and I laugh. Like, whatever happened to a good old sneak attack? Huh? You know what his plan was? He said, what we're going to do? I've been thinking about this all night. <laughs> They're expecting us to hide. <laughs> so we're going to let them see us. That's a bad plan. But I thought even that could preach. Because what I felt like God told me was, listen, I don't need a good plan. I just need a plan. Because I can work with a plan. What I can't work with is paralysis. Even if you got a bad plan. A bad plan with an omnipotent God is a good plan. It's a good plan. Verse 8 through 10, if they say, halt, don't move until we check you out, we'll stay put and not go up. But if they say, come on up, we'll go right up because then we'll know. Somebody needed to hear this at church today. I feel this heavy in my heart because then we'll know. I don't know right now what God is going to do. But if I do what I can do, then we'll know what God wants to do once I do what I can do. Because my job is just to get into position so that God can do his job, which is the miracle. Then we'll know. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. This is fear. Fear is what you can't control freezes you. Put it on the screen. What you can't control freezes you. Here is faith. What you can't control frees you. What you can, uh, if something happens outside of my control, but I did everything that I could do, woo, and you got faith, that frees me. To know that whatever happened, that was God. So I'm going to just do what I can do and not be afraid. What really gets me is when I look back at the situation and wonder, could I have done more? But when I do everything that I could have done and it still turns out the way that it turns out, I am free from that. So I'm not going to worry about getting sick. I'm going to take my vitamins. I'm going to drink my green powder. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to sleep eight hours. And then maybe God will give me a long life and I'll be healthy. I don't know. But I will only know if I do those things. If she's out of your league, shoot your shot. 
Maybe God. <laughs> you don't know. Maybe God comes through and does a miracle. Your job is to put yourself in a position and then let God do the miracle. I'm not going to worry about not being able to buy a house. No, I'm going to keep on tithing because God said that my, my, the storehouse would overflow if I put him first. I'm going to budget. I'm going to pay off debt. I'm going to save for retirement, save for the down payment, and maybe God will make that dream house available. But that part is up to him. My part is to do what I can control, to do what I do. I'm not going to worry about World War III in the middle. East right now, starting in the Middle East. I'm going to worry about fighting for peace in my house. I'm going to throw out the garbage. I'm going to do the dishes. I'm going to play with my kids. I'm going to take my wife on date night. I'm going to pray for the Middle East. I'm going to come to church. I'm going to vote for elected officials. I'm going to control what I can control so I can have peace or I can have peace. And then release the rest to God. Here's the last two. I'll go through them quickly. Next one is flip it. Flip it. So I say flip it. it. Fear is contagious. How many people know that? You see 100 people running in that direction, and that's a good thing. If you see 100 people running in that direction, you better run in that direction. (laughs) Don't be the one person in the horror movie that is always a woman, unfortunately, women. I got your back. I don't know why they do it to you. But there's always one woman. 100 people run that way. There's always one woman in the horror movie that's like, I wonder what that's about. (laughs) It's like, oh, man, you'll get killed. Go with the people. Run that way. Right? And so, so it's good that, that fear is contagious to a extent. But I think we got to be careful because here's what the Bible says, uh, Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And here's how the world thinks. Here's what I want you to flip. Here's how the world thinks, and here's how we're going to think. The world always thinks worst case scenario. Always thinks worst case scenario. Why? Because it's unknown, and we don't, we don't know what the unknown has to offer, and so it's going to be the worst thing. But you know what the beauty of the unknown is? You don't know. It could be the worst. Or what else could it be? What else could it be? It could be the best. But your mind don't work that way. So through the Word, you've got to renew your mind so that it can work that way. Last Disneyland Paris story I don't know if you know this about the parks, but over there, they don't have the same regulations on rides than they do here in America. So all the rides are faster, higher, more loop-de-loops. Like, it, 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 that part's awesome. We started getting on rides that we were like, the ride in Florida is okay. Then we rode it over there, and it was like, we got on Thunder Mountain over there. It was like a minute longer. It felt like it was going 10 miles per hour faster. We went on all the rides that we could, and we were like, this is, this is way better than that. Than the ones there. And then at the end, I told my wife, I was like, babe, I think we should go try Dumbo. <laughs> you know, the one with it. She's like, no, we've been on that ride. I'm like, you don't know. <laughs> at this point, for all we know, Dumbo takes off. <laughs> for all we know, Dumbo has a loop de loop in it. Get harnessed in, just rotates and flips. I don't know. We don't know. We don't know. It could be the same as it was. Or it could be better. Joshua 1 9, have I not commanded you? As Joshua walks into the unknown, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Where's he going to be with you? Wherever you go. So, ready? Here's how we're going to flip it. Here's how we're going to flip it. Here's how we're going to flip it. Stop believing the devil's going to show up wherever you go and start believing. God's going to show up wherever you go. Flip it. Flip it. Flip it. It's going to be a bad day at work. It's going to be a great day because God's going to be there. I'm afraid of getting married. I'm afraid of commitment. I'm afraid this marriage is going to end in divorce. Flip it. God's going to be in your marriage. Y'all going to be celebrating 50 years one day. Flip it. I'm afraid of having kids. I don't know. Flip it. Those kids are going to grow up to be great and ministers and businessmen and presidents and government leaders. And Flip it. Flip it. Flip it. Flip it. Believe that God's going to show up. Here's the last one. Last F. If you're afraid, fear God more. More. I remember when I was a kid and my friends were trying to get me to do bad things. And I wouldn't go. And they're like, you afraid of being called the punk? I'm like, a little bit. But I'm more afraid of that man right there. (laughs) 
I'm more afraid of my pops and what he'll do if he catches me doing these things. Uh, here's what Matthew 10, 28 says. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. <clears throat> Anytime hell gets on the screen, everybody gets real tight. I'm gonna, I promise you this is actually an encouraging verse. Can I show you how? I have extreme boundaries when it comes to my purity um, and sexual purity and relational purity. Uh, extreme boundaries. Some of them uh, offend people. Like, uh, I don't DM women on Instagram or social media even if they write to me and it's a whole thing going on in their life and they're looking at me for prayer and things like that it's just it's a line I set I don't do it and I had someone um, on staff and some other friends say aren't you afraid that they're going to accuse you of being extreme accuse you of being weak accuse you of being insensitive and I'm like absolutely like I, I'm afraid of what people say to me unfortunately I got to work on that but there's someone I respect more than random people. Because the word fear in the Bible means revere. It means to respect. And so as much as I fear what people will say about me for living life that way, I respect Liz more. So I'm going to do that. Does that make sense? What's going on in the Middle East is scary and it's sad and it's but I fear God too much to allow me to treat people different because of the color of their skin or the brand of their religion because all people were created in the image of God. And so I got to love everybody. I, I, when things get tight financially, I cut back on Starbucks. I cut back on Disney passes. We don't, we don't have Disney passes this year. Maybe we'll get late, we won't have them right now. Why? Because the anniversary trip. And so we cut back on that. But here's one thing I'm never going to cut back on, tithing. Because I fear God more. I respect God too much. Are you with me? Write this down if you're taking notes. There are times when the right thing to do is scary. Fear God more. There's a friend of mine who recently opened up to his wife about something that he had done while they were married years ago that she never knew. And I know it terrified him afraid that she would leave him afraid that she would move out take the kids take the money take the everything that belonged to her but you know why he did that because as afraid as he was of hurting his wife as afraid of what she was leaving he was more afraid of the presence of God leaving him more afraid of not being in right standing with God he feared the consequences but he feared God more and there's somebody here needs to have a conversation somebody needs to do something scary and you're afraid of the consequences did God ask you to do it because if God asked you to do it start thinking about what the consequences of that looks like to live in disobedience it's not going to benefit you and by the way he didn't say hell to scare you he said hell to free you because he's saying I'm the only one who can send you and I died on the cross so you wouldn't end up there so he's not saying that you are going to hell. He's saying you don't have to be afraid because the only really scary thing in existence is hell and you don't have to go there because of me and what I did on the cross for you. Here's the message. Here's the message. I just need to take home with you. In Christ, we are finally safe. At the end of it all, no matter what this world throws at you, no matter what the doctor says, no matter if the cancer gets bigger or if it recedes, no matter if, if the kid comes home or if it, no matter what happens, listen, when this ends, you are in peace and in paradise with the Lord your God and those you love forever and ever. You are finally safe. Turbulence hit my plane one time. I was like, oh. I was with somebody ministering. They were like, you afraid? I'm like, a little, but not too afraid. I said, how come? I said, like, because this plane is either going to Hawaii or heaven, one or the other. <laughs> I know where this ends. And you can take a breath, y'all. 
Because in Christ, you are finally, finally in the finality of it all. You are safe. Anybody have peace like that? I'm talking about. Amen. Right where you are, would you bow your head and close your eyes? I want you to rediscover that peace in your life for just a second. For those who know Jesus and have a relationship with Jesus, I want to give you one minute, 60 seconds right now to recall the finality of it all. Come on, you've got peace in the cross, peace in the resurrection, peace in the sacrifice of Jesus. He died, so it doesn't matter what happens to you. It doesn't matter when it happens to you. You are good. You are safe. You can sing it out to the Lord in your own way. We don't need to sing it here just yet, but I'm safe in you. I'm safe in you. I'm safe in you. No matter what the, the, the next test reveals, I'm safe in you. I'm safe. I am finally safe. I know my job situation isn't looking too good, but I'm finally safe. I'm going to frame my fear in the context of God's power. I'm good. I know my marriage is a little rocky right now, but I'm finally safe. I know that God is in control, and I want you to begin to feel, begin to feel the peace of God, begin to feel the love of God. God flood over you right now wherever you are at East Campus online allow the, the love of God to begin to flood over your life right now yes Jesus yes Jesus in that same spirit in that same attitude you can only find safety if you are in Christ and so if there are those who are standing outside of Christ today you have not made verbally or in, intentionally a decision to follow him and make him the Lord and Savior of your life it doesn't take a Bible degree and it doesn't take perfection or profession you don't have to have grown up in this. All you got to do is try to love him and commit to follow him. And if that's you today and you're in this room and you want to make a commitment to live in Christ so that you no longer have to fear, what does that mean, JJ? That means that you are asking him to wipe away your past. Every bad choice, every sin, you are trusting him with your future. If that's you on the count of three, I want you to just raise your hand ever so, ever so slightly high so I can see you. I can pray for you on three. We're not going to ask you to come up. We're just going to ask you to raise your hand over at East, online, all over this building. If that's true, you're ready to come back to Jesus. One, two, if you can hear the sound of my voice, raise that right hand if you're ready to come in Christ. One, two, three, right now. Shoot your right hand high. I want to see it. I 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 see it. Today's a new day for you. Today's a new day for you. Today changes for you. Today changes for you. Today changes for you. Today changes for you. Whether you raise your hand or not, I want you to pray this prayer out loud with me. Everybody in the room, whether you raise your hand or not, Father God, Today, I decide to put my trust and to put my safety in you. Lord Jesus, you are my savior. And you are the one who saves me. Come on, I say this next part good. And you are the one who keeps me safe. Be my Lord. Forgive me for my past. Protect me in my future. I give my life to you, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. And amen. Come on, put your hands together. Welcome everybody who made a decision to follow Jesus today. Hey, we're JJ and Liz Vasquez, and we wanted to say thank you so much for watching and engaging in today's content. Maybe today you made the decision to follow Jesus. We want to celebrate the incredible decision that you made. All you have to do is text JOURNEY to 55498. We would love to walk this journey out alongside you. Hey, don't let the journey stop there. We love for you to do one of three things. Either subscribe, share, or support. If this ministry has blessed you at all. Subscribe so you don't miss out on any new videos. Share it with a friend. You never know what the people closest to you are going through. Or you can choose to partner with us through generosity, which helps bring these videos to people like you. Thank you so much for connecting with us. Be blessed.